couple of our crack Syracuse uh, analysts, Matthias Altman Kurosaki and uh, Hayden Wasserman, are going to take a look. Fellas, tell us about some of the worst trades of all time. And I can actually say that I was traded from the Arizona Diamondbacks to the Cincinnati Reds for a couple of exhibition games. And I think the Diamondbacks made out on that deal and the Reds got the short end of the stick. <laughs> Having said that, we move on. Gentlemen, take it from here. So today we have four trades for you. Um, most of them are old, but one of them is newer. The first one is the infamous Nolan Ryan trade. Uh, this is going to be a little bit upsetting for Matthias, who's a big Mets fan, but he traded Nolan Ryan to the Angels um, on December 10th, 1971 for Jim Fergosi. Yeah. Um, and while it's well known that it, it was kind of a fleecing by the end of it, Fergosi was no, you know, you know, bum himself. He was 29 years old, but he did have six all st- all-star um, appearances. He got MVP votes eight times. Uh, he hit, you know, his OPS was 16% above average in his time with the Angels, which is very impressive over that amount of time. Um, the only issue that he had is he missed 55 games with a f- tumor in his foot in 1971, which was obviously the year before he got traded. Now, the Angels got Nolan Ryan, who we know is one of the best pitchers of all time today. Um, but he was coming off his worst season. He was an, about an average pitcher at the time. And he had the second worst whip among 89 pitchers with 150 plus innings pitched at the time um, for 1971 season. And he had the worst walk rate at that time as well for that season. So it's not like he was the pitcher that you think of today as Nolan Ryan. Um, you know, he was a little bit on the downswing and he was getting a little bit worse. Uh, and they also got Leroy Stanton, who was an unproven outfielder. So at the time, it didn't look like such a bad trade. So, um, as you can see in the next slide, uh, Jim Fergosi's stint with the New York Mets didn't work out as planned. Um, he continued to suffer injuries, including a broken thumb. He had less than a full season under his belt with the Mets before being traded um, you know, to the Rangers for cash in 1973, uh, hit 15% below average for OPS, and he only had five home runs during his time. Now, the Angels, on the other hand, got off with not one, but two really, really good players. Now, Nolan Ryan's obviously the one you know, but Leroy Stanton, um, was no, you know, he was really, really good too. Uh, he played 594 games with the Angels uh, over five years. He was their everyday right fielder. And, you know, he was, he played a solid amount, 400 plus plate appearances in three seasons. And he had a 110 OPS plus at least in three of those years. Um, and he ranked above Dave Winfield and Lou Brock, who we'll get to later, uh, you know, in OPS plus in 1975. So he was a solid player for them. But obviously uh, the best player they got was Nolan Ryan, who, was basically the best pitcher that time, undoubtedly, in the eight years he played. He was the best. He had the lowest hits per nine four times. He led in Ks per nine six times with strikeouts per nine. He averaged almost 20 complete games a year, which is just ridiculous as someone who was born in 2002. It's just unheard of. You basically have that that amount like every year for the entire MVP. Um, 15% above average in ERA. And he was first in strikeouts during that time period. And that first to second gap is the same as second to 13th, which is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and second, by the way, was Tom Seaver. So it's not like it was some random guy. He was a five-time <laughs> all-star in his time with the Angels, and he finished top three in Cy Young voting three times. So although it looked like an even trade at the time, uh, Nolan Ryan really developed his game well. Um, he got his walk rate down, and he pitched more and more innings and struck out more and more guys. And for Gosey, who just was towards the end of his career and injury issues struck him, which you'll see as a, as a theme here in these four trades. So our next trade it was a trade between two uh, pretty intense division rivals, say at least mm-hmm. the Cubs and the Cardinals. The Cubs trading Lou Brock to the Cardinals, who at the time was a 25-year-old outfielder for Ernie Broglio, who was a pretty good starting pitcher for the Cardinals. I mean, in 1960, he led the league in wins with 21. He had the lowest hits per nine rate. He also had the best ERA plus and a Across six seasons with the Cardinals, a 119 ERA plus is really good. And he posted a 3.00 ERA and a 2.99 ERA in the two seasons prior. However, there were some injury concerns, including him having to get 20 cortisone shots in 1961. Meanwhile, Brock at the time was just, he was midway through his third season with the Cubs. He was a pretty fast runner, but only had 50 stolen bases in his career. And he only had an 88 OPS plus through that that point in his career to only 77 OPS plus for that season. However, I would add that while it doesn't necessarily show up on his baseball reference page, is that Lou Brock, when he was with the Cubs, was one of the few guys to hit it over the center field fence at the polo grounds. So that is one thing. So at the time, I mean, the 
Cubs are getting a star pitcher. The Cards are getting an unproven outfielder. So really, at, at the time, it's understandable why they did this. Uh, Broglio's stint with the Cubs, though, did not go as planned. Mm-hmm. In 1964, all right, a solid 3.82 ERA. But in 1965 and 1966, in 115 innings pitch, he had an ugly 6.61 ERA, a 6.19 fielding independent pitching, and a negative 2.1 war. All these are worse in the majors by a lot. Mm-hmm. And after that, after uh, actually, he was also sent to the minors during this stretch, which is pretty pretty disappointing for a guy who looked like an ace. He did not appear in the majors after that 1966 season, and he was only 30 years old. So the Cubs ended up with the short end of the stick for sure. Meanwhile, Lou Brock turned into an absolute superstar in St. Louis, primarily as a left fielder. He was a six-time All-Star, six-time stolen base champ, including stealing 118 bases in 1975. He stole 888 bases for his career, all of which with, or most of which with the Cardinals, which is the most anyone's had for one single team, a 112 OPS plus overall, 293 batting average, and he was a top 10 finisher in the MVP voting five times. And of course, he's enshrined in Cooperstown as a Hall of Famer. So overall, rough trade for the Cubs and the Cardinals and made out like bandits. Yep. One last thing I want to add about that trade is at the time, um, according to the uh, Wikipedia page, they said that the Cubs, the, everyone thought the Cubs got a steal, not the other way around. So it wasn't just that they thought it was even. They actually thought that the Cubs uh, robbed them as well. So this next trade is one I'm sure, Tom, you're very familiar with. Well, in my opinion, this next one should be number one. And I don't oh, say that because this is in no particular order, I mean, th- th- this is brutal, this trade. Yeah, this is tough. Brutal. Is and then so, the famous line was uh, the DeWitt family, which owns the St. Louis Cardinals now, Uh, Bill DeWitt's father was the general manager of the Reds, and the quote is something to the tune of Frank Robinson was an old 30. Yep, exactly. That's Yeah, that's exactly what he said. So he said he's not a young 30, which is really interesting, as you see. You'll see the stats later that he got from the Orioles. But his production went down a little bit, but he was still one of the best players in the league at the time. He was 30 years old. He had won an MVP in um, 1961. I should say NL MVP. He was a six-time All-Star and – 50% 50% better than, you know, an average hitter, which is ridiculous. Uh, now, they did get a solid player in Milt Pappas, who was a 26-year-old starting pitcher. He was already a two-time All-Star, um, and he had a 2.6 ERA in 1965, and he had a 3.24 ERA in nine years with the Orioles, which is really, really good, especially mm-hmm. at his age. Um, he was still very young. But his underlying stats predicted regression, which obviously is not something they used in 1965, so I'm not blaming them for that. You know, they really just used ERA at that time. But – as you can see on the next slide, um, he didn't pitch super well, according to ERA with the Cardinal, with the Reds, excuse me. His 490 innings in two and a half seasons, but he did hold a 3.23 fielding independent pitching during this time, which you know basically means that can mean that the fielding didn't help him out a lot um, and that he limited home runs. Um, that was actually the best of his four total stints, including his one uh, with the Orioles. And that was even better than his uh, 2.60 ERA season where he had a 3.31 uh, fielding independent independent pitching, I believe. Um, yet he still had a 4.04 ERA, which was the worst of his four stints. So although his underlying stats were better, um, the stats they used at the time looked worse. So they gave him away for almost nothing. But the underlying stats proved to be, a, you know, they determined how he pitched in the future as he had a 3.36 ERA after his departure from the Reds for the rest of his career, which is really, really good. Um, but he did not work out for the Reds. Meanwhile, Frank Robinson played six seasons in Baltimore. He won the AL MVP in 1966, uh, World Series MVP, and the Triple Crown, which was the season directly after they traded him. So um, immediately it just looked like a terrible trade. He was a six-time All-Star after age 30, which is nuts. And he hit 300, had 179 home runs, and a 169 OPS plus, which was 19 19- percent or 19 better uh, than he actually had on the Reds where he was still a fantastic player he finished top three in AL MVP voting uh, three times so the Orioles really made out like bandits here and uh, you think you know, the, the Reds GM didn't look so good on that comment no no and I will add one more thing which is that that 1966 World Series my my father was a Dodgers fan at the time because of Sandy Koufax and so he did not take too kindly to that but anyway Here's our last trade, which you alluded to earlier, Tom. The Mariners trading Adam Jones to the Orioles. 
in February of 2008. So the full trade was that the Mariners received Eric Bedard for Adam Jones, Chris Tillman, George Sherrill, and Cam McColio, which, to be fair to the Mariners, Eric Bedard was coming off a fantastic season and really a great stretch for uh, for the Orioles. No, he was 28 years old at the time. He's fifth in the Cy Young voting in 2007, led the league with a 10.9 strikeouts per nine, had a 3.16 ERA and a 3.19 FIP. He also had the best hits per nine rate at 7.0. He, he struck out just about just over 30 percent of the batters he faced. So really, you can't blame the Mariners who went 88 and 74 the year before for doing this trade, really. As for the other guys going going to Baltimore, I mean, Adam Jones was 22 at the time. He had, had some cups of coffee in 06 and 07, but not a ton of playing time. Chris Tillman was a top 100 prospect. He was only 19 years old at the time, the starting pitcher. And George Sherrill, who was a stalwart in the Seattle bullpen. So th- those were the pieces going to Baltimore, along with McColio, who was a minor league reliever. Anyways, Bedard wasn't bad necessarily in Seattle. He started 46 games between 2008 and 2011, 255 in the third innings pitch with a 3.31 ERA. But he also did not pitch at all in 2020 because of shoulder injuries. And his 2008 and 2009 seasons were both shortened by injuries. The injuries, he suffered a torn labrum and he had to undergo shoulder surgery. And then in the summer of 2011, the Mariners traded him to the Red Sox at the trade deadline. So that was an unceremonious end to Bedard's career with Seattle, which really looked promising and just got derailed by injuries. Moving right along to how the Baltimore side played out, George Sherrill was an all-star 2008, albeit with a 4.73 ERA, but still hit 31 saves and remained as the closer in 2009 at a 2.40 ERA and then was traded to the Dodgers since the Orioles were out of the race. So he finished that year with a 1.70 ERA in total. Then moving, moving on to Chris Tillman, he was actually a stalwart for the Orioles in their rotation. He threw just over 1,100 innings. He played in 10 seasons for Baltimore. He was an all-star in 2013 and really – led those successful Orioles pitching staffs to a few playoff appearances. He won at least 11 games four years in a row, three seasons with at least 30 starts and 110 ERA plus. While his career ERA is only 4.57, that's partially inflated by the last couple of years where he struggled. But overall, Chris Tillman was one of the better pitchers for some pretty good Baltimore teams. He even started the wild card game in 2016. And of course, the last piece of this trade, Adam Jones, who played 10 seasons primarily as the center fielder for the Orioles, was a five-time All-Star, a four-time Gold Glover, was the, uh, won a Silver Slugger in 2013, career uh, overall hit 279, 319, 459 with a 109 OPS plus and two, 263 homers. So he was far beyond what was initially envisioned, I would say. He, he basically was the face of the Orioles for a bit and – yeah, that, that's how it all played out. 